Hi everyone, this is Tori Vandalin with Prevent Connect. The podcast you're about to listen to was recorded in July 2020, when Ashley Klein Jimenez and I got to talk with Janae Sargent, Yuvia Cervantes, and Morgan Martinez about how their respective organizations have adapted prevention programming in the time of the COVID-19 pandemic. Our current context is always shifting to adapt to this crisis and other compounding and ongoing crises. And we hope Janae, Yuvia, and Morgan's conversation brings hope and inspiration to you, as it did for me and Ashley. Take care and enjoy the podcast. It's been really great to hear, you know, how this all came to be. Um, and we want to know how, how were youth involved in this process? And with the youth being involved, were there any, um, were there any impacts of prevention that, that happened that you all didn't anticipate? Definitely. We also run a close to home program at at RISE and our youth really wanted to be a part of this project. So we got 50 yards of teal fabric shipped to my house and then I washed it all, put it all in bags and delivered it to our youth volunteers. And they worked with their families and their guardians who are also all sheltering at home Um, to cut the fabric, to put the kits together, and I would go around and and pick it up. And for them, they felt like they had something to do where they were responding to their community's needs. They were able to work with their hands and kind of get out of that Zoom fatigue. And such a, a really wonderful thing that I wasn't expecting to come out of it was I made a lot of connections with the youth's guardians that I wouldn't have before because they're all at home. They had a project to work on together. There are a few families who had not been very involved in the work, even though they knew that their kids were working with close to home and working with RISE. And in the process of constantly dropping off fabric and picking it up and talking to them on the phone, we now have each other's numbers. Whereas fast forward now, when we're living in a world where a lot of our youth are going to protests and standing up for racial injustice, their parents will call me and let me know where their youth are, make sure that they're safe, that they have support systems. Those are connections that would not have happened without this project. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, For our youth in Planada, um, they kind of got involved with just cutting the general shapes of the masks. Because first I brought up if they wanted to know how to sew, if anybody did know how to sew. But it sounded like they were at a low capacity kind of dealing with all of these changes. And most of my youth are seniors in the program, so they were still experiencing that loss. But I think it was good for them to just cut the shapes out because it gave them something to do. And at the time we were still trying to figure out how to move forward because technology um, isn't really accessible to youth out in Planada. We don't have strong internet connections. So it was awesome that they had a hands-on activity to do and it was just a low tech strategy. And um, yeah, they did a good job cutting the masks. And I think maybe one of the unexpected impacts was I know one of my youth mentioned their families just helped them cut it. Their younger sisters helped them cut a couple shapes out. And I'm going to assume that they had some of those conversations about what Sam was. Thank you for, for sharing both of those. Janae, your, your story of, you know, it went from dropping off masks to now being a, a protest safety check-in person for youth. Um, I think that, that really shows how, um, like you all had mentioned earlier, the, the root of prevention is not just teaching people what to do and what not to do. It's about building community and having social support and community connectedness. So I really appreciate you all bringing that in. And it sounds like there there's an overarching theme of being able to connect with adults and family members in youth's lives that, that have been historically a little difficult to reach. Um, 
and now folks are able to have those more intimate conversations as they're they're making masks together or just curious about why is all this teal fabric in the living room mm -hmm. um so that that's super special to hear thank you thank you both for sharing those stories and then tori like like you said um <clears throat> prevention is more than just talking about the um the warn the uh, sexual assaults or, or domestic right um, and I thought it was, it's a great, it's a good idea to that the kids were involved doing this mass skill as well, because so some of the purpose or the whole purpose of our program as close to home is making leaders in the community, right? Showing them how to become leaders. Well, as a leader, you have to th also think outside the box about, you know, well, this is what's going on. Before we panic, let's sit down and think about it. As a leader, what can we do? And I think giving them that responsibility too, it's not just them seeing us, I'm just a high school kid. You know, there's, you know, I can't do anything right now, only the grownups. But we're giving them the tools. And, and then once they, they figure out from the kid how to, how to make the mask on their own or cut or whatever little piece of a rice they were able to put in, um, they did it. And I know that they're very happy seeing that their seniors or other families in the community wearing their masks because they put the effort into it. That's so awesome. I, I really like that you brought up that point of um, creating leaders in your, in your community, specifically creating youth leaders and having an opportunity for youth where you know, they, they can really take ownership of it. And it's so visual too, um, where, you know, maybe you're walking down the street and you don't necessarily look at someone and recognize them as, oh, that's that person who liked our post on Facebook. Uh, where when you're walking down the street and you see someone wearing a mask that you made, um, I feel like that would have such an impact on, on youth as far as being able to really feel proud of the work that they're doing in, in their communities. So you all have, have discussed it a little bit, but, um, you know, I'm really hearing a theme of what it means to be a preventionist and the importance of listening to your community and how that plays into an intersectional and anti-oppressive approach to, to prevention, all leading into um, community support and social cohesion. So I just wanted to give you all an opportunity to, um, you know, tell us more about how else have your prevention programs focused on community and social cohesion and support during this coronavirus pandemic? Or, you know, I, I feel like I have this statement in my head and maybe we all do. I'm imagining we're all going to think of her voice when I say this, but I think of Alejandra Aguilar with the partnership to end domestic violence when she always says preventionists are chameleons. And I feel like that has been the theme of prevention and, and close to home and our, and our organizers since COVID started and everything that's happened since COVID and the racial injustice in society. And, you know, we've really tried to be flexible and throw out our plans every two seconds to respond to the community need. It started out as helping to create some online infrastructure of how to connect people to others in their neighborhoods who can do their grocery shopping. We started doing what might seem like really silly Instagram lives of watch me cook or watch me create care packages and deliver them to my friends. Um, one of our youth volunteers has chickens and she would do a weekly check-in with her chickens just to offer people opportunities to connect with each other. Um, and then now we're starting to create content about local business owners, local black business owners and how people can support them. And, you know, I really do feel like our volunteers and our program has just been pivoting and adjusting because everybody's needs are constantly changing right now and that's okay. 
because as preventionists, we have to respond to the community and what the community is asking for. So it's, there have been a lot of trials and errors, um, but I'm, I'm proud of them. I mean, I think if anyone were to, to go onto our close to home, slow social media, they would probably see that we've been through a lot of changes in the last few months, but I think that's been kind of the theme of our world. <laughs> Um, for our youth program, some of our social support has been allowing time and space during our meetings to just kind of share what's going through their minds, just giving the youth an opportunity to process what's going on in the world and talk about how they're feeling. And I think right at the very beginning of the COVID-19 closure, I threw together a last minute printout packet and I included all kinds of self-care tips. Um, journaling prompts and ideas and I'm just constantly working in just self-care into our programming and encouraging them to share it with their family and friends also. Yes yeah, so and with the adults what I did was um, the adults I seen that it was a little bit more more anxiety and stress because their their significant other or their spouses were not um, they getting they were getting laid off the kids were at home not going to school so there was a lot of anxiety and stress building up one actually one of the group members she suffered um, a stroke and and that's when we're like okay how about as a group you know let's do a i know we, we're doing two meetings and was something new but let's do like a support group within each other. And if we can help each other, then we can also help other community members or other family members. So at least try to stay uh, more calm during this time. I know it's, it's really hard, but, um, but well, yeah, with the, once the group knew that one of the members has suffered from, a, has uh, stroked, we all actually, and then not only that, but at the stores, there were, um, there was no food, there was, um, hard for us to find anything in the shelves, any toilet paper and all that that went crazy in the stores. So what we did as a, as a group member, everybody was like, let's donate something from our pantry. So, you know, one put the beans, the other one put potatoes, the other one give out the milk um, or things like that that they had extra of. And then I drove to, to her house to the lady that got the stroke and we delivered the food. Um, I couldn't really get to see her because she was in bed, but I left her there outside with the kids. And of course, we wipe everything down with sanitizer, the, the wipes, the lights of wipes to make sure that it was clean because she had suffered a stroke and she was more liable to get sick or get some whatever else we had. She was very grateful. And um, I saw how the group, they were, they were also going through the stress, but knowing that they were able to help someone else that were more in need that helped them feel better about themselves and it was like okay we can do something even though we are home we can still help it one you know one another and then later on when they did the mask as well i know it was a lot of work and it was a lot of masks that they were they had to make so i came with the idea and i asked um, my supervisor if it was okay for me to go deliver them some pizzas especially because the the lady that had the stroke you know she couldn't get up and cook for the family. So that's what I did. Um, Planada is a very small community. They really don't have much restaurants. So I went, I drove, I went to Merced. I bought them Little Caesars or Little Pizza and I took it to them. And I just knocked on the door. So I'm like, here's a pizza for you and the kids. And the kids were loving it. Their kids were happy. They were like, oh my gosh, thank you. I was like, yeah, you know, just a little appreciation for all the hard work you've been doing. So that's I'm thinking how we cope with with the stress of COVID by being um, working as a team and being with each other and helping each other with whatever basically like a little canceling section with, with within us in the group. Oh gosh, that um, I've really been enjoying listening um, to you all share 
you know, the ways that you have to adapt and pivot um, and be chameleons, but also just be, you know, places for support and safety for your communities. Um, so, you know, once again, just really appreciative for, you know, sharing what is not nothing that we've ever been through before. Um, and so everyone's kind of figuring it out. So I'm just really appreciative of you sharing how you all have um, walked through this, this time. Um, with that said, unfortunately, I don't know that much is going to be changing, you know, in the next couple of months. Um, it seems like there's new information every day. And so, you know, this might be more of a long-term adjustment that um, we have to make personally and also in, in, you know, the community work that we're doing. And so I think that, you know, this is going to continue to be a really important conversation for folks doing prevention. And I'd love if we could, you know, as we end this conversation, if you all could just share, you know, a tip or any advice to other prevention practitioners who are listening um, in terms of, you know, meeting community needs, adapting prevention programming, um, or even just taking care of themselves. Uh, as we, you know, continue to move through such a, a different time than any of us have experienced. Um, so any, any tips or advice that you can, that you want to share with fellow prevention practitioners? Yeah, you know, I, I think what I always go back to, I went back to it before COVID-19, but I just, it's always running through my head now is, embrace thinking outside the box and doing things that you haven't done before and taking risks. I tell my staff all the time and my team all the time that I would so much rather them experiment and try things and get out of their comfort zone and that not work out and then learn a lesson and then try something else than just stick to what we're all used to. Because it's like you said, this has never happened before. There is no program in a box to do prevention during COVID-19. Um, and really with prevention, it's our jobs to explain how responding to other social and cultural issues relate back to sexual and intimate partner violence prevention because it's not just one dimensional. And I also think understanding that we can do everything we possibly can and we will never replicate what we were doing when we were doing in-person stuff because preventionists are usually people people um we're community organizers we enjoy being in groups and in meetings and and if you feel discouraged and if you don't feel like you can fill that hole that's natural and it's okay and take the time to grieve about that um i think that's something we struggled with at first was we were like okay we're in a pandemic let's just let's respond to this and then we found that we were all really empty um so no one's doing it perfect. It's, it's okay to mess up and it's okay to take your time, but I guess lean into being uncomfortable right now. Um, I totally agree with everything Janae said. I think that's awesome advice. And I, I definitely wanna highlight um, not being afraid to try new things and just listening and responding to what the community is asking for or what your participants would like at this time because there's always a way to incorporate your mission and just um, giving that community support I think is really important right now kind of like if we can't take care of ourselves we can't do the work that we're all passionate about and want to do so I just think it's really important to highlight self-care um, with ourselves and even with our participants Yes, and also um, just remember, I mean, sometimes you think that you're the one going to a struggle without realizing that there's, you know, the youth, the kids, the, um, the anyone in your community 
is actually going through the same thing as you or thinking almost like the same thing as you, but we all struggling. And if as a, as a prevention team, if you have an idea and you, and you don't know how to develop the idea or where to start, I mean, we all here together, you know, they can send an email and be like, Hey, RP, you know, RP team or adults or for the, or for the youth. Do you guys want to get together and talk about what's going on? We can even do our own little support group within us ourselves too, as well. So don't feel um, bad about reaching out to us. Um, maybe they're good ideas. Maybe they're crazy ideas, but something can come out of it. And maybe it's a good transformation for the community or for yourself. Um, also, there's, uh, in my case, there's days I'd be like, okay, what am I going to do now, right? We're not doing our mappings. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing in the program. But I find out that I can still help the people by reaching out to other organizations. For example, they do the food distribution. I've been participating in that. And I think that it's a good idea of if there's people like that in your community to reach out and work with, because not only are you helping each other, but if I need to recruit people, that's a great way for other community members that I haven't met yet to see me around and be familiar with my face and hopefully later on we can be part of the close to home, you know, um, prevention team and recruit more people <laughs> by them looking at me and saying, oh, you know, that's the girl who was helping so-and-so and I remember her and hopefully we can make more friendship like that and more um, be connected with more people from the community. So yeah, I mean, feel free to reach out to to our own RPE team and see who's available for support. I think it, it can be so easy to feel like you're not doing enough right now. I mean, when we're used to going in and, you know, prevention takes a really long time to see results, but to see a change in someone, to do workshops in classrooms, to be at community events, you feel that. And when we're all at home and what feels like doing really small things, it, it's easy to feel very listless, especially for people who are action oriented. But what the community is missing right now is connection and what we're providing, what every single interaction that you have, whether it's offering support to your volunteers, whether it's connecting with other organizations, connecting to other RPE people, even just texting someone that you work with or you've interacted with or met through your program. Those are really powerful moments right now, I think more than ever. Um, and I think it's important to try to keep that in mind that you are making a difference, even if that difference doesn't feel like it did six months ago. Thank you all so, 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 so much for joining us on this podcast. I, I feel like for a lot of people, it's really easy to lose hope right now um, or to get wrapped up in a panic. And I feel like everything that you all had shared today on this podcast um, has helped ground me personally. And I, I hope it does the same for our listeners too. Um, in, in pausing and thinking like, what, what does the community need? What are tangible ways that I can help? Um, and I really appreciate you all bringing up that, you know, when we say this is unprecedented, we, we mean it. It's, it really, there is no precedent for what's happening right now. There's no precedent for prevention. Um, just like there's, there's, you know, not a lot of precedent for all the other things that, that folks are dealing with. Um, as a result of stay at home orders and COVID-19. So just being able to, to be flexible and be creative and, and give each other permission to take risks and make mistakes, you know, as long as, as the community need and community voice is at the center, then we're still, we're still having an impact on folks. Um, so I really appreciate that, that conversation and um, how you all really highlighted the the absolute necessity to bring prevention back to its roots of being community based, you know, having community organizers involved in it, and um, yeah, just being social supportive of folks too. So this concludes our podcast together. 
thank you all so much for joining us and we hope to um, talk to you all again soon and and potentially have an update. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Thank you.